All right, hello and welcome to the second Montana conversation of the summer hosted by the library. Thanks for logging on and joining us. This is What's Happening to the News. And this event is sponsored by the Belgrade Community Library Foundation and presented with Humanities Montana. This program is part of the Democracy and the Informed Citizen Initiative administered by the Federation of State Humanities Councils. The initiative seeks to deepen the public's knowledge about and appreciation of the vital connections between democracy, the humanities, journalism, and an informed citizenry. We, the library, are proud to bring this program to the Belgrade community and Montana community in general because there's a lot going on out there in the world and it's hard to tell what information is real, what news is pertinent, and how to tell fact from fiction, quite frankly. Um, the library prides itself on being able to bring information literacy to people and we're thrilled to have an opportunity to do so with tonight's presentation. Now, a little about our presenter. Dennis Swibold of Missoula, Montana is a professor and director of Montana's, the University of Montana's School of Journalism where he has taught for 27 years. He earned a bachelor's degree in journalism from the University of Arizona in 1979 and a master's in journalism from UM in 1991. Dennis is the author of Copper Chorus, Mining Politics and the Montana Press, 1889 to 1959, a history of industrial domination of Montana's newspapers, both of which, or I'm sorry, of, of which the library does own a copy if you're interested in borrowing it. Um, the work won the Western Writers of America's 2007 award for the best work of contemporary nonfiction. Congratulations, Dennis. And he continues to research and report on public affairs issues and lead conversations about the changing face of journalism. In 2014, he taught a graduate course in American political journalism at Shanghai International Studies University. If you are interested in signing up for the Humanities Montana monthly email or the library's monthly newsletter, please let me know. I'm dropping a link in the chat box right now uh, and will again at the end uh, for the post attendee survey. Please take a minute at the end of the event to submit your thoughts so Humanities Montana and the library can continue the excellent programming we both strive to provide. And if multiple people are watching, um, please fill it out per, per person. Um, each survey is important and it helps us with our numbers. Um, so if there's two people watching in your home, have both of you fill it out separately. Um, in case you're wondering about what else the library is up to, our next Montana Conversations virtual program is next Thursday, um, same time, six o'clock. It is featuring storyteller Hal Stearns and it's titled Montana Towns, Then, Now, and Always. And you can learn all about Montana's past leaders to start a discussion about Montana today. And you can register online at belgradelibrary.org and I will again drop a link in the chat. I will keep an eye on the chat box uh, during Dennis's presentation. So if you have any questions that come up and you don't want to interrupt, feel free to drop them there. Um, and if you want to, you can feel free to unmute yourself and ask um, during the uh, presentation. And then when Dennis does open it up for discussion and questions, feel free to turn on your webcam and, and unmute yourself and we can um, hopefully have a lively discussion. So thank you everybody again for joining us and take it away, Dennis. Thank you, thank you. It's good to be here. Uh, I, uh, I'm glad to, to uh, be talking about the subject that I think is so important and uh, uh, it's only becoming more important all the time, I think. Uh, as as the news media changes, as the as the news becomes more uh, global, as it becomes more fragmented in some ways, we've got to find ways that we can we can look for things that are going to be uh, look for ways to find the news and information that we need. I'm also glad to be uh, that uh, Hal Stearns is coming next week because Hal is from uh, Harlington, Montana, and his father, uh, Hal Sr., was the editor and publisher of the weekly newspaper there, the Times Clarion, 
And my wife's uh, father also worked with Hal Stearns at the Times Clarion for years. And she later became the editor of that paper too. So maybe it's all in the family here. But you know what they say about Montana, it's just a small town with a lot of space in between the streets. So uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and flip through some, some, uh, some clips here, uh, some uh, slides. Uh, but if you have a question, please interrupt me. I'm glad to, to answer any questions that you might have. I hope that I get to most of what you're, you're thinking about in the course of this presentation. Uh, uh, but uh, if, if I don't, or if you want more explanation, I'll be glad to do that. We don't have that much time and some of these subjects are awfully complex. So uh, I, if I don't know the answer, I can at least point you in the direction of finding it. Uh, and I'm also really glad to be working with libraries. They've been great allies. Uh, in the information literacy uh, efforts that are going on in, in Montana and around the country right now. And I think they've got, we've all got a lot of work to do there in order to help uh, make that uh, something that's better because we all need to know how to negotiate this new changed media environment better uh, and, our, and our students know how to do that. I don't know how many of you uh, remember and maybe uh, I'm the oldest group here, or oldest person here, but when I was a youngster, I remember there being a, a daily newspaper. Uh, I remember my mother getting the weekly from her hometown in Kansas. Uh, it told uh, mostly hyper local kinds of stories, who was having dinner, who was visiting, that kind of stuff. Uh, we got the daily newspaper that told us about uh, some national things and international things. So it kept us in touch with a broader world. Uh, I had maybe two or three television statement stations. So I had uh, nightly news from three networks, uh, but that was essentially my news environment. I didn't have much in the way of local television or local radio news. If I got it, it was in five minute segments at the top or the bottom of the hour. So when you think about it, that was a very uh, uh, a scarce sort of environment. News wasn't everywhere. And I like this, to use this desert well, as kind of an analogy. Uh, uh, if information sources were like water uh, in the desert, there just weren't that many of them. And you know, when something's scarce, it becomes more valuable, it becomes more in demand. And I think that's the case. Uh, I can still remember watching the nightly news and CBS when Walter Cronkite was the anchor man. And I don't know if any of you remember Walter, but he used to be able to look at us at the end of his broadcast and say, and that's the way it is. And he would sign off and you had a feeling that that's the way it was. He knew a lot about what was going on around the world. And in that half hour, he was able to sort of highlight all the major stories in an in a authoritative and fair way. But, but that scarcity, the fact that there weren't many news sources also gave it a kind of authority. Uh, it, you know, there weren't that many, many people to turn to. So you tended to believe them if they sounded like they knew what they were talking about and they had a big, robust news gathering organizations behind them. So that was my news universe. It was fairly small. Uh, I don't know if some of you know this, but I used to be the editor of the Bozeman Chronicle. I came there as a, as a reporter in uh, 1984. And uh, uh, so I knew both of uh, Belgrade and Bozeman communities. I knew there was a weekly in Belgrade, there was the daily in Bozeman, and there were some weeklies in uh, in uh, Three Forks and elsewhere. So that was kind of our news environment. I would go cover uh, county commission meetings and there would be uh, reporters from those, those weekly papers. There'd also be reporters from, from radio news stations, uh, two or three of them there. Uh, they, uh, they were, they were uh, scarce. There weren't that many of us, but we're, there was an air of competition among us. We wanted to find out stories that uh, would enlighten our audiences. And we also knew we had some pressure to make sure that we didn't get beat on stories. We wanted to make sure that people knew they could trust us to find good information first. So that was a very competitive environment. Uh, we came out once a day, and uh, this will really test your age. If you remember the Bozeman Chronicle being an afternoon daily, that's when I worked for them. We got the newspaper put together and hit the press a, a little afternoon at about 12.30. And uh, when I left to come to the University of Montana in 1989, the first thing I worked on was a plan so that they could go to morning publication and do, did a redesign for the publisher then. And uh, they eventually did it. 
Uh, so that's a morning paper, but news on a 24 hour cycle today sounds almost ridiculous. Uh, news uh, is happening all the time. Uh, and if we look at the, just the sources of news that some of us use, you'll see that they, they just come uh, everywhere, uh, from everywhere. And it's available 24 uh, seven. Smartphones, social media, all those things uh, have brought uh, information uh, to our fingertips uh, in just in, in copious amounts, so much so that we can't possibly sort through it. And uh, we sort of rely on on uh, uh, ways of sifting the news to kind of tell us what goes on. Uh, we uh, are on Facebook and our friends share stories. We get maybe our news there some, some, somehow. I feel as a professional, I have to subscribe to so many different news sources. And I do, I subscribe to national ones for national and international news. And I subscribe to local ones for state and regional news. And then I subscribe to hyper local ones too. And that's a lot when you think about it, most people, don't do that. I get paid to follow that kind of stuff. But for for average folks, it probably comes down to to, to this little thing right here anymore. Uh, this phone is constantly going off. It's constantly telling me uh, something that's new. My local newspaper, the Missoulian, it's a daily newspaper, uh, tries to compete in this cycle by publishing updates constantly throughout the day. I'm a digital subscriber. I don't get a physical paper anymore, uh, but I read the Missoulian cover to cover more or less in the morning. And then all throughout the day, I'm getting notices and bumps. And if I was on an iPad, if I, were, if I was on a workstation computer, if I was anywhere that I was sort of logged in and with my phone, I'd be getting constant uh, information and updates. And that's just one of the news sources that I follow. So it's like drinking out of a fire hose right now. There's so much information. How do you look at it all? How do you decipher it? How do you tell what's going on? And that's uh, part of the, uh, what, we're, what we wanna talk about today was, is how to uh, ask good questions. And along with all of this information, if you're gonna get it from so many sources on such a faster cycle, uh, you gotta be worried that there's gonna be information in here that gets corrupted. And if you know much about social media or you know much about online news, you know it's built on something called algorithms and it's based a lot on what you like. So if I wanted to, uh, you know, if I like uh, pets or if I like uh, fishing or if I, whatever the case may be, I'm gonna see a lot of ads for those things. I'm also gonna see news about those things. I might also see uh, things that give me just kind of what I want to read. Uh, but I'll also occasionally be given information into my feed that's from outside sources. And sometimes that, those outside sources can be hacked for information too. Not so much on the local level, but on a national and international level. And into websites that suddenly appear and you don't know if they're real or not. You don't know who's behind them. You don't know who's putting out this information. And this isn't much different uh, than just your own common sense in your own communities. I mean, you know how trust works. You have to know if somebody has a record, you have to know what the, their history is in terms of telling the truth and how many times they get it right. And do they exaggerate? Uh, do they tend to pass on things before checking them out? Uh, all those things are, are things we've always had to deal with when it comes to truth but we have to do that constantly now because there's so many sources of information. Just, if, just on your Facebook friends feeds alone, uh, if you're getting news and information from a lot of different people, chances are they're clicking on things all the time and sharing them and uh, without much of a thought in terms of what's true or not. And that's something that I think is uh, a little scary. And it's why we really hope that people start learning about uh, information literacy so they can do some research themselves and uh, learn a little restraint when it comes to clicking and sharing. I, ha I have students that I teach and uh, they're uh, young journalists and they see things coming through their social media feeds and they don't know if they're true or not. Their whole judgment is whether they're entertaining or, or humorous or make them kind of angry or whatever the case may be but they often share this kind of information uh, just because uh, they think it's interesting and other people will click on it too. And uh, that's something that's very different. If you were working on a newspaper, you were working on in a media or a television station, you know, 20 years ago or, or even last, even today, 
uh, when, when before you print something, you have to go through a verification process. You have to defend it to your editors. They're gonna be asking you tough questions. And those questions are the ones that, that are not hard to guess, but they're hard to prove sometimes. Where did this information come from? Can you verify it and corroborate it with other kinds of sources? What, what are other people saying about this kind of news? And that's a way that we can get into uh, some information literacy uh, 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 disciplines that I think is really important. It's always been a, 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 a discipline for journalism. Uh, but right now, you know, it's so fragmented, it's so uh, politicized that if you're watching uh, the entire news universe, you might get totally different things. There are some days when I might turn on cable television and I might go to different places and covering the same event and I might think I'm watching uh, two different communities or two different sort of worldviews about things and and that can be true uh, fox and nbc news are almost diametrically opposed in their coverage they see themselves as pl as playing to uh political uh factions in society and there's nothing wrong with that there's nothing illegal with that they can certainly do that they have a right to do that but when you start to 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 play to to a news or to a, a faction you start to shade and you start to uh, maybe not look at whole things. You're more interested in promoting a certain uh, political point of view than you would be. And that's why this cartoon used to be uh, fairly funny when I would show it because uh, we're talking about who started the American Civil War and, and the kids says Fox and NBC. And it certainly looks that way sometimes. Uh, although we, we, know that that's, uh, we know that's not the case. They're just looking at things through completely different lenses for an audience that, that they're trying to make sure they, they, they feed uh, correct information. And all of this fragmentation, so many uh, websites, so many different sources of media, just the cable channels alone that you have, satellite radio, uh, websites from everywhere, uh, all of this is fragmented to the point uh, since uh, the highlight in 1976 on this chart that shows trust in the media was about 72%. That was uh, at a high uh, for that period of time. It's probably been higher at earlier periods of time. Uh, but you can see that uh, by 2000, when you start to have deregulation, you start to have talk radio, you start to have uh, satellite radio, you start to have uh, Facebook, you start to have uh, cable deregulation. So you can have 500 channels and they can all specially uh, tune themselves to certain different kinds of audiences. You see that overall, there's not that one sort of source that everybody goes to or a handful of sources that they can kind of agree about. There's so many different shades uh, to the news. So the result, and it's not that uh, hard to understand if you think about it that way, is that there's less trust uh, in the media in general. Now, I, I, when people claim uh, or tell me that they don't trust the media or the media gets it all this wrong, you know, those are things I tend to hear a lot of, a lot of when I'm talking uh, to groups. Uh, I'm careful to say, you know, which mediums are you talking about? Which specific news organizations are you talking about? Because it's not a monolith. They're not all the same. Uh, and uh, that, uh, that's a strength that can also be a kind of a weakness sometimes too. Uh, but they are different. And, and if you, it's just like people, you wanna be judged on what you do and how you come across. But this shows a trend uh, uh, if that is continuing. Uh, there's not that much trust. And uh, in, in an era, uh, era where there's little trust for, the, for, for information, uh, people are gonna dispute it and who knows what's authoritative. How, what the, so, the, so the result is there's lots of confusion. And when there comes to uh, events like uh, uh, and the ec epidemic that we're in right now, you can see how so many people are so con confused about basic kinds of information uh, in a changing dynamic sort of system. Uh, this is a chart that's put out by an advertising uh, agency uh, uh, international one that does kind of a, uh, 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 kind of a survey on which sites are, are tend to be more neutral, uh, which which types are more fact based, and you can see them sort of at the at the top in this little square, and you can see things on the right and the left, 
and at the bottom when you see them they're less they're less uh, 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 truthful in some ways more misleading they're, or they're very selective in their facts. They only show the ones they agree with. They don't even uh, uh, pay attention to the other side. I, you know, this is a, this is a best guess. This is an estimate made by people who do uh, this survey. I don't know that it's exactly right, and it's certainly going to change from day to day. Uh, it's hard to know exactly what goes into people's minds when they make these kinds of decisions. But in my own point of view, I think this is probably fairly close. It's not out of line uh, with uh, uh, news that people can trust the most versus news that they probably trust less uh, in some different areas too. So if you're looking for uh, who do you trust, uh, this can be a helpful way to kind of think about it. Who gets it, uh, who based the information mostly factual and who has a robust organization that does check things out and and uh, and test it uh, for its veracity. Uh, there's a couple things going on uh, in addition to that that you ought to know about. I mentioned at the very start that that one of the problems that we're facing today is not just uh, who knows what's true, but uh, just a real pressure on good journalism outfits to stay alive. And I think this is probably even a more serious problem than information literacy in some respects. I think local journalism, uh, especially around the country, uh, is, uh, is having an awfully hard time and is in danger of disappearing to a large extent. And that's because of the economics that have gone behind uh, the digital revolution that you probably are all familiar with. If you're uh, uh, getting your information on the internet, if you're watching digital advertising, uh, you should know that it costs much less to produce and it's much more profitable because it can be easily replicated and shown on lots of new sites. So this is a projection about uh, where digital uh, marketing is going to be uh, over the next uh, four years and you can see the internet is going to get 160.8 billion of it and that TV's digital is going to get a lot more than that. Uh, and you can see that digital is, is bigger in most categories uh, than uh, re, uh, typical traditional kind of advertising. If, you know, in days when I worked in newspaper, if somebody wanted to come in and buy an ad and they would tell us what they wanted in the ad, we had a department that was set aside just for that. They weren't connected to the newsroom, uh, uh, but they helped you build your ad. And then they not only put together your ad, they sold you the space in the paper for that. So that's how the paper made money. And that's how it supported its journalists by selling native, they called it, because it was built locally and sold locally, uh, advertising. Well, native advertising is, is, is getting rarer and rarer all the time. And so you can see that when it comes to newspapers in the middle of that spectrum, uh, they've lost a lot of that. And you might think, well, what about television? What about radio? What about all those other sources that we have now? It's true, there are a lot of new sources. But when it comes to local journalism, newspapers have had kind of an outsized influence. Uh, a TV, local television station, a radio program may be a uh, half hour or an hour. When you take out the commercials, it's much less. When you think about the time that is spent on weather and sports and you take those big chunks away, there's not that really much, there's not much in the way of local news that's reported. And if you think that that's true for your local newspapers, that's, uh, that's a very astute observation. They just don't have the, the uh, revenue anymore uh, to have robust kinds of uh, 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 numbers of people in their news organizations and journalists working for them covering lots of things. And that's a problem, I think. It means there are not that many people showing up to cover county commission meetings or to cover school board meetings, or, or maybe those things are boring, but I think most of us are kind of glad somebody's there and making sure that, that they get it right or there's some questions being asked about, about the veracity of all those kind of things. And that's what I worry about the most. Uh, uh, I think a lot of people who get their information for free mostly today, and most of us think we do, uh, don't really understand uh, that local news uh, organizations are facing a much tougher time. 
Uh, and I think, you know, you have to stop and think about it. If those places vanish, if they uh, deteriorate to the point where there's not many people working for them, if there are fewer in number, and that's actually happening in great swaths of the country right now, they're called news deserts, uh, great parts of the country, particularly in the South and the Midwest and encroaching on the West have lost, you know, dozens and dozens, dozens of newspapers. So there's less uh, information, there's fewer reporters out there covering stories uh, that really matter to, to local communities and you won't really miss that until it, it's gone and there's nobody watching uh, how, how a, a local civic institutions really work. So those are the economics behind it. I think you gotta understand that so that you can see what's going on, but it's something that uh, you don't hear talked about an awful lot about local news sources, but the reality is, is that many of them belong to, to large groups or chains of ownership. And uh, it's di very difficult for them to keep up uh, digital revenue. It doesn't make as much money as the traditional native print advertising did. And if that's a news organization that's in debt, uh, then, uh, then there, there's, there's room for other buyers to come in and take control. And some of those buyers may be hedge funds that have very little interest in local journalism at all. Uh, and they may be interested in just you know, writing this down and as long as they can and then selling the, the buildings and selling the equipment and making what money they can uh, out of the demise of, of the, that kind of institution. Now, there's a lot of news organizations that belong to news groups uh, that were always concerned about the money and always concerned about the business end of it too, but they also have long-standing commitments to their communities. Lee Newspapers, and some of you are familiar with that one, has papers in, in, in uh, Helena, in, in Butte, and in, in Billings, and in Missoula, and in Ravalli County. Uh, it's been uh, owned by a, ch a chain, an, an Iowa-based chain of newspapers since 1959, and it's gotten to be a fairly big one, uh, but its staffs have shrunk too. Uh, they made some big purchases right before the 2009 recession, and uh, that fin those financial difficulties have allowed some of the hedge funds to buy some of their stock, which is becoming cheaper and cheaper. Uh, and you're seeing that at lots of newspapers uh, everywhere uh, uh, in, in the country. So uh, I think it's a problem. And uh, the people are looking at different models to come up with the ways to sustain local journalism. And I think it's important that people at least subscribe, at least take part in conversations about how they can keep this vital resource going. This is a map, it's about a year and a half old, came out of a study at the University of North Carolina, and this is where newspapers have disappeared off the map. Um, the, dark, the ones in blue are, are, are dailies, the other ones are weeklies, uh, and daily newspapers are really have kind of an outside influence. They're much more expensive to operate. They tend to be 24 seven, uh, seven days a week and operate around the clock in terms of news gathering. Uh, when you lose those sources, you lose a lot uh, in those local communities. And of course, we have uh, right now the other uh, epidemic, and uh, this is uh, the, the coronavirus. And this has happened so fast. It has happened, uh, it's such broad global context uh, that the science has been playing catch up from the start, as it often does. Uh, in cases like this. Uh, and it creates a, a lot of confusion, especially when we get different kinds of information from the people that we traditionally look forward to, to political leaders. When we get some information from even healthcare leaders, uh, it doesn't sound right. Uh, or or there, it's happening as we speak that the science is just catching up. We want answers now. That's part of our human uh, condition. I mean, we wanna know, what this is deadly, it has an effect on us. We wanna know what the answers are. We wanna know what's going on, but there's an awful lot of false news being spread around uh, regarding this. A lot of false cures, a lot of information on, on what the causes, uh, misinformation on what the causes were. It's been uh, politicized to a great extent. Uh, this is a, a, a web page called Politic Fact, and it's put out by a journalism institute called the Pointer Institute, and it's really a kind of a journalism school and resources online. But they, this is where they teach a lot of journalists how to fact check and 
and, and, and verify information before they put it out. And they have a coronavirus uh, database that talks about a lot of stuff that's been debunked, uh, uh, false claims and theories, uh, things that don't work. And it's a dynamic kind of situation. I'm no doctor. I'm, I don't play one on television. I didn't sleep in a Holiday Inn Express. I haven't done any of those kind of things. But I'm looking for credible health uh, information from credible health uh, uh, people right now. And I'm looking for people who, who are more comfortable than the public is, quite frankly, with uh, some uncertainty. And scientists tend to be that way. They know that we don't have all the answers to, to every question that, that we want to ask right now. We know that even as we're talking about vaccines, we're gonna to have to do tests and we're gonna to have to do more than one. And if one looks promising, that's not enough. We're gonna to have to have others that verify and, and, and replicate the experiments that are going on. They're gonna to have to do that kind of stuff. And we can't spend a lot of money going down rabbit, hole, rabbit holes of false information. I remember one, uh, there have been so many, uh, so much fake news about coronavirus that it's almost an industry all itself. And you'll find a database of just coronavirus misinformation at PolitiFact. So it's a good source I'd suggest you take a look at. Uh, I mean, there was one that said that you could kind of cure yourself by putting a hair, hair dryer on your face and breathing it. There's another one that said that if you drank lots of tonic water, uh, it would go away. There's another one saying it was caused by 5G uh, phone systems. Uh, and another very per persuasive one uh, that said it was caused uh, it was by weaponized bacteria uh, from China. And we're pretty certain that the virus did come from China, but there's no evidence to say that it was a, that it was a weaponized uh, a deal uh, spread around the world because China suffered from it too. And it's serious. And uh, unless we we're honest about what the causes are, we're not going to find the cures. And we're not going to uh, find the kind of corporate uh, and political and social culture that it takes to, to see if we can't uh, stop the spread of this, uh, this pandemic. So uh, coronavirus information is, is out there everywhere. And the, you know, th this is a story that the New York Times did a couple of weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago. And they said it really did catch much of the world by surprise. Uh, even the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, which is probably one of the preeminent virus and, and scientific uh, uh, institutions in the world, uh, was dealing with old technology and poor data and its bureaucracy was slow. And the information it was getting from the politicians was in direct disagreement. And so you saw a lot of loss of confidence, even among people in the public sphere, about what they should do here. And all of that kind of hampered our reaction to the process. I think we're up, at, up to 150,000 deaths right now. Uh, and uh, and uh, it's not hard to see that number uh, growing uh, before we see a solution here. Uh, and uh, so it's nothing to sort of take lightly. Uh, it's something that demands good, hard answers, even when they're not available. And one of the things I like to hear from health officials is when they don't know the answers to the question, they say so. They say, here's what we don't know. Here's what we're searching. And here's why we can't give you that, that specific kind of answer you want right now. And here's our best uh, estimate about how that will work. I don't know if you remember, but even the early messaging about the mask use was sort of co uh, contradictory. But again, this was happening in real time. And as they got more evidence, they got more uh, information about people spreading it who didn't even have symptoms. As they learned more about that, then ma even, even the information and requirements about masks seems to change uh, as a result of that. So uh, what humans don't like, uh, uh, uncertainty. And when that happens, we start to make up uh, reasons for it to happen. So the conspiracy theories going around this uh, whole pandemic have been pretty amazing too. There, to be fair, there's been conspiracy theories around almost every major epidemic in the history of the world. So it's nothing new. We all want answers and we want quick answers and we're willing to blame people that we don't like and, and are willing to come up with sort of crazy sort of ideas. 
but they keep popping up. Even though we debunk them, they keep getting, they keep popping up from one source or another. And there, there's a segment of the population that's believing this stuff and sharing this stuff, and it doesn't seem to stop. Uh, here was a, a there was a, a, a viral quote documentary called Plandemic that said, you know, this 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 uh, epidemic was a planned sort of weaponized uh, thing that was going on, and and although that had been debunked, and researchers said that's not true, and the and the researcher who put that together was also shown to have gotten so many things wrong that it that it really wasn't funny uh, that that pandemic research and that sort of documentary keeps popping up. And a local television a, a group that owns local television stations, Sinclair, was gonna run a, a, an interview with this researcher uh, last week. Then when people heard about that, they said, wait a minute, uh, have you read all this stuff about how, how this stuff has been disproven and, by, and over and over again by lots of people? Uh, and the, what made this different is this was a local news site. It wasn't a national news site. Uh, promoting a particular thing. This is local news, which we don't tend to think is, is politicized that much. Well, the backlash was so great that Sinclair, which owns uh, uh, station, local stations all over the country, canceled that broadcast. So, so, you know, common sense can prevail, but this stuff just keeps coming back and just keeps coming back all the time. Uh, here's one that just came out this last week, and this is hydroxychloroquine, and it's been dismissed and disproven by uh, a lot of different sources now as as a, as a treatment for the virus. But we keep saying, we keep hearing this that it's there, and it's dangerous to take this stuff. It causes problems for people, uh, and we have uh, uh, people who are still making these kind of complaints. Uh, the the president's son. Uh, tweeted this out just the other day, or Facebooked it just the other day, and Facebook kicked it off. And then the president tweeted it, and, and tw Twitter kicked it off. Uh, and it just shows you, though, how this stuff keeps coming back. And when it comes from people who are in prominent kinds of po positions, of people, some people tend to believe this kind of stuff. But you still have to ask the basic kind of uh, questions. And that kind of fact checking is important. It's important when it comes to political campaigns too. And, and I'd encourage you to, to pay some attention when you're watching the ads about all the different races. Uh, Montana's gonna get so much money spent on TV ads from, uh, uh, from people supporting Bullock and people supporting Steve Daines uh, that we're gonna be overwhelmed. The new sources in the state are gonna be overwhelmed. But probably the most experienced uh, Montana reporter out there is named Michael Dennison. And, uh, uh, he's been doing TV ad watch. He works at MTN News and he takes apart all these ads that sound a little crazy to you. You wonder what's really true and what's not. And he takes a look at them and, uh, and tells you what the record has shown about these kind of cases. And that's a real service. And that's something that journalism uh, can do. Uh, and he's uh, pretty fair about doing this. This is a, about uh, Bullock support uh, for healthcare. And this next one is about uh, Dane support for healthcare. So he's he's fact checking campaigns from uh, a campaign advertising for both of these uh, in in or behind both of these candidates too. So it, it's it's a service to do this kind of stuff. Uh, if you're not good at this and you don't know how to check facts and you don't know what's true or what's not, I recommend you use one of these fact checking services. Uh, there's one. Uh, uh, I don't know if it's hidden on your screen, but there's there's a PolitiFact, factcheck.org, Snopes, uh, and one called MediaWise that's based on Instagram. Uh, but what you can do is ask questions. If you hear a, a, a complaint that's being spread on social media, you can see if it's true. And they've probably done a fact check on it. They've done uh, hundreds of thousands of fact checks. They can't get to everything because there's so much of it. Some of it comes from people who just wanna make money from the clicks that, that this, this crazy information generates. Some of it comes from, from bad actors from, from foreign, foreign countries who want to make us look bad by uh, peddling misinformation. Uh, uh, and it's a hard job, but these guys pay some attention at it. I play a game with students. I come up with all sorts of claims. I show them how to use these fact-checking sites. Uh, and it's really useful for them to do that kind of work. 
But the basic uh, story for information literacy, the basic questions I tell people to, to ask themselves are, uh, are pretty simple. Who's behind the information? Uh, what is it coming from? What's the reputation? What evidence do they have for this stuff? And look for evidence. Is it convincing? Is it persuasive? Is it just a one-off thing? Is it one person said this? Or did they actually done a study? Have they done two studies? Have there been five studies? And finally, what do other sources say? Uh, that's something called lateral reading. Let's look and see what other author authoritative uh, sources around the place are saying about these kind of things before we click and spread this information. And very few people do that. I think all of us are guilty. I know I am of, of clicking and sharing something that, that I didn't check as thoroughly as I wanted to uh, online because it's so easy to do. And online companies know, uh, social media companies know that the, their biggest drivers are th things that make you angry or things that you find incredibly hilarious. Uh, in other words, you're reacting emotionally. Uh, and that's what makes people share this kind of stuff. So a little, uh, little calmness, a little take a breath, step back, ask yourself some questions, go to a fact checking site, or if you've got the time and inclination, you can look up this stuff yourself and find out what's behind this kind of thing. Just learning how to recognize the difference between advertising and non-advertising, it can be a more difficult game. Uh, if you look at this, uh, uh, this uh, post here, this is from, uh, the US, the Japanese em embassy, and it's about how wonderful Japanese emb embassy uh, relations are with the United States. And it's put together by the Washington Post brand studio. You'll see it up there. And it's content, it's sponsored content. In other words, it's advertising. They bought it. And when you buy it, you can say whatever you want. Uh, and that's the difference between that and news that gets to be vetted. Uh, but this is the message that they want to say and the message they want to spot. We teach students to look for sponsored content. So this flunks the, the who's saying it test. Maybe they're right. Maybe there's nothing controversial about this. But when I'm paying you to say something, that means I'm not probably brook, brooking the downside to that, that story when we talk about it too. Here's another one uh, presented by Bank of America. Uh, do, do millennials have good money habits? I mean, this may be perfect. This may, there may be not a thing that you dis, you disagree with in, in this uh, information right here, but you also know that the reason that they put this out because that they have uh, financial products that they do want to sell. So there's a motivation uh, to, their, uh, to the information that they're giving out. And sometimes that can sway them to not show you other kinds of things. They're not gonna show their competitive products, uh, I suspect. Uh, but things like that uh, need to make you a little more cautious too. Uh, social media, this is, a, this is supposed to be a, a 3,000 person march for democracy in Iran. And it says, uh, uh, incredible. Uh, and if you look and you try to find out who put this out on Twitter, it's Cambry and who is Cambry? Uh, I can't see that very well. With the stats, he's a recovering California refugee, political radio news commentator, citizen advocate, women for Trump. In other words, she's been an activist and an advocate, and she may have a, a stake to play. But so you got to be a little suspicious of what she's put out here. Uh, so let's take a look at it. And if you look down in the corner, it says it's from Bahrain Doctor. And if you know anything about Bahrain, they were having marches uh, and protests about for democracy at the same time. Uh, and this is, in fact, a photo from Bahrain. It's not in Iran. It's not 300,000 people. It's an entirely different place. It's a made up piece of, this is really fake news, folks. This, is, this isn't a mistake. This isn't how somebody sort of got it wrong. This is a conscious attempt to mislead you. And if you go on uh, Google, and if you go on these sites, you can actually put photos and pieces of video on there and they will show you where they appeared before. And that's how fact checkers were able to find out that and this clue that said Bahrain doctor, uh, that this actually took, some, took, took place somewhere else. So that's an important clue to take a look at too. Uh, Snopes, uh, this is what they said when they looked at it. Uh, it can't be true. Uh, it's unrelated footage uh, that some social media sites were trying to pass off as something new. Here's one you ought to take a look at. Uh, just take a look at this one. It's Polls Show America, uh, Most American Own Guns. And it's by Mason Simpson. This is a Twitter 
uh, post. Uh, and then there's a link to a, uh, a little bit of a news story there. Uh, if I were to ask you what this means, you might think it means most Americans own guns. Well, in fact, if you look up this site that's uh, said at the bottom and you read how this sounds, you'll know that they just, they're just talking about people who own guns, why they own them. They're not talking about how many people own guns. So if you want to find out how many Americans really own guns, you've got to go to Gallup poll and find out what, they, what their latest poll said about that, because it didn't, certainly didn't say that most Americans own guns. In fact, the number was about 36%. So uh, knowing this basic sort of information, uh, literacy stuff helps. This is called lateral reading where we went through and looked at the sources, find out what they really said, what did the headline say versus what they really said, and it's different. And Mason Simpson, I have no idea who Mason Simpson is. I don't know why I would share this information unless I was you know, uh, trying to you know, get somebody's goat or if it was a joke or, or what I was trying to do. So it doesn't make much sense. We can, we can stop sharing this kind of stuff uh, and uh, it's gonna make a big difference. Uh, I'm going to skip this next slide. Here's another one. Uh, it shows uh, some deformed daisies. And they said this is, these are flowers that were near the Fukushima nuclear plant. And this is what happens when they get birth defects. Here's another one. And this is uh, on IMGUR, IMGUR. It's a photo uh, sharing site. Anybody can publish something there. Anybody can say anything they want to there. So uh, we have no way to check this. When you do look for this photo, you'll find that it was taken at a place 200 miles away. When you find a, a look, continue to look for other stories on what causes these kind of mutations in daisies, you'll find that some of these mutations happen naturally. Uh, and there's no direct link to what happened at Fukushima there. So uh, that's one way to debunk this, this kind of information. Uh, here's a, we call it click restraint. Uh, stop clicking. And this is a thing I give to students sometimes. And it says, you know, we're going to do, we're going to have school uniforms. Pretend you're at a high school and they're thinking about doing school uniforms. Obviously going to be controversial. So we Google school uniforms. Now, which of these are you going to uh, uh, search for? If you're a professional fact checker, you're not going to spend a lot of time reading any of these. You're not going to click on all of them. You're not going to read all of them. You're going to go down probably to the second one where it says research on school uniforms is minimal. And then you're going to look about look at what research they have. You know what the arguments uh, against are going to be. You know what the arguments are going to be for. That's not going to be hard to find if you wanted to tell that story. But what does the research say about what it does? There's not that much of it. And maybe that's the story. So let's look at what research uh, has been done. Uh, you make some of these decisions to research very quickly, quickly, but we don't share information that isn't pertinent. Lots of problems with fact checking today. Conspiracies. Uh, just multiply so rapidly. Uh, hoaxes get magnified. People call things hoaxes that aren't hoaxes. Uh, fringe movements, all this stuff outpaces fact checkers. There's even a phenomenon that if fact checkers say something is false, uh, that makes people who believe in conspiracies all the more uh, insistent that they're right. Uh, they, they see this as a persecution and they feed on that. And that makes some of this stuff go wrong. And the very fact that fact checkers can't, can't mark everything as, as right or wrong because there's just so many more claims than there are fact checkers uh, leads people to some suspect almost everything they see or hear. And I think uh, you kind of have to be that way. Uh, you have to uh, do some lateral reading. You have to do some fact checking. You're going to have to look for sources that you trust to, to do it over time. We're, we're suspicious of experts, we're suspicious of authorities these days, and all the different changes in technology and media and the politicians, frankly, have driven this kind of division because they're, they gain from this. Uh, they can get more people uh, on their side if I can make you uh, disparage the other side on these kind of things. That's old as politics. Uh, but now you have social media, you have things you can point to that makes it, makes it look authoritative. There are fake news sites. Uh, there are news sites that don't really have any local news on it. And they're just uh, sort of waiting to put, to put uh, uh, one own factions advertisements or sources on there. Uh, so it's a, diff it's a difficult problem. 
uh, and social media platforms aren't eager to be held responsible for the truth in most of these cases. They don't want to play umpire. They don't want to sort of make that decision because that costs them audience, that costs them money, that costs them, them share. Uh, I think I'll stop there. I've been talking quite a bit. Uh, and what I what I'll do is is open it up to questions, uh, just to make sure. But I want to say that one question that almost always comes up is who do you trust? And I think you have to trust somebody. And here's my quick uh, uh, piece of advice for who do you trust? I trust somebody who who does verification and research, who takes the time to look things up to see if they're true. I trust somebody that does that regularly and routinely and routinely gets it right. I trust somebody uh, uh, also who tells me when they get it wrong. And that's become kind of an important one for me. Uh, everybody gets stuff wrong. Everybody makes a mistake. Uh, everybody uh, may, may call, uh, you know, just honest mistakes and reporting at the speed of light these days. They make mistakes, but when they make mistakes, do they tell you we made a mistake? Do they correct it? Do they tell you where they got it wrong? Who, who admits their mistakes and who doesn't? That's a pretty good clue as to who uh, you might want to trust. So I'll, I'll shut up now and, 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 and entertain any questions you might have. Uh, anybody, uh, I'll uh, stop the share and uh, get you all back on the screen. If you'd like to talk about any of this, I'd be glad to. Any questions? Hello? Don't forget to unmute yourself if you want to talk and ask a question, and I'd be glad to do that. I think I can, I can unmute all of you. So feel free. Uh, is there anything you want to know? Hi, hi, I'm Douglas Moffitt, and I'm with my wife, Jennifer. Um, with the news cycle that is just in such a hyper speed, right. you see a lot of foreign newspapers um, scooping stories ahead of the United States on stories that are in the United States, because I'm finding when I'm reading a lot of times later in the evening, I'm seeing store, like newspaper articles from the UK and then the next morning it's picked up by the local or what I say local, like New York Times, Washington Post media. That's, that's exactly right, you know, and that's always happened and good big newspapers had people who watched the wires constantly. So they were, they were people who even when the newspaper had been published who were still there reading the wires from England or looking for those kind of stories so that they were ready to check them out, verify them. Do we know any more about this? Can we get another source? Can we, is this true? Uh, so they might do it. Uh, but today, I mean, The Guardian is one. It's an English newspaper. Right. Uh, I think one of them in the UK Independent is another one that I've been seeing a lot of quick stories on. And they're pretty aggressive. And uh, uh, I think they've uh, made a name for themselves. Uh, and coming up with asking good, tough questions and verifying uh, kinds of stuff. And, and they also print corrections, you know, uh, and that g gives me some, some uh, credibility. But I probably wouldn't go by just one other news source's word alone. I would want to see what other major news sources uh, said about that. I mean, there's a lot of criticism of the mainstream media today, but the mainstream media has sources. Mainstream media is, uh, uh, I mean, the New York Times has 1,700 employees. There are not too many news organizations that have that kind of robust presence all over the world today. But I kind of look to them as part of one of the, as part of the, 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 the ecosystem of uh, things that I'll bounce information off of. What is the Times reporting? What is the Post reporting? What oh, yeah. I definitely see that. I definitely yeah. do see that. And it's just that sometimes I do see The Guardian in the UK, in some of the UK papers reporting first. Um, but, you know, in this whole hyper, you know, divisive media people, I do see, um, you know, I don't understand how when you have 1700 employees, countless awards, people are now calling you fake. And, you know, that just drives me crazy um, because it's, you know, they're now looking at stuff that's only been in, you know, business for 
months in a couple of years, maybe, or this election cycle, or maybe two election cycles. Um, so it's, I do check my stuff. I usually take the story and then search it on the internet to see what other sort, what other medias have it before I really start reading it, I guess, because a lot of it, you can find a lot of dead ends. That's so smart. And, and really there, you know, I wish I knew more languages. I wish I could read news from more places. I mean, there's just not enough hours in the day to read all the news I'm trying to stay up with. So it's a hard thing to do, but you know, it, it's always been in politicians' interests. Uh, in Montana, for example, back in the, the turn of the last century, if you were running for the U.S. Senate, you had your own daily newspaper. <laughs> uh, this is before we had PR firms and advertising agencies. You actually owned the news uh, or parts of it. And if you could make uh, your opponent look bad and cast doubts on their credibility, uh, but I think this concentrated attack on the news media uh, is one that uh, you know, we saw that distrust meter go down, and you can see how if you were uh, a politician who wanted to distract people from something or wanted to attract them to your explanation from things, uh, uh, discrediting mainstream uh, media that was asking tough questions about you would be one of the first things you'd want to do. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm, I'm glad to hear somebody else use the Guardian too sometimes. <laughs> uh, I think it's a, I had, I had students get stories published there. I have a question. Yeah. Um, how do you think the issue of net neutrality plays into all this? I heard a lot about that earlier this year and I wondered how you think that affects. Right. I, think, you know, about. I do think uh, there's an awful lot to be to be talked about when it comes to uh, the net and access, public access to that. And you saw that all the big tech media guys were in front of Congress just yesterday, uh, getting grilled on whether they're monopolies. Uh, so I think, you know, uh, free speech is something that most Americans have, have thought was important. It's amendment number one, and uh, you know, it, it's up there. So I've been, you know, a lot of people are sort of reluctant to sort of say, you have to do this, you have to say this, you have to, to, to do this kind of stuff. But they are looking at them in terms of antitrust and as businesses that are monopolies. We do tend to regulate monopolies. Uh, when it was US Steel, when it was uh, the Sugar Trust, when it was, uh, you know, Standard Oil, uh, those kind of things was another way to look at it. If they stifled competition, if they made it so that other people could not get access to to cheaper quality or cheaper goods or quality goods, or really put them into a, a bind, then, then these are other things that you want to look at. Ne neutral net neutrality worries me if I think that, that some people just can't get on the internet. I mean, one of the promises of the internet was that everybody could have a platform and a voice if they wanted to. Now, the problem with that, making that ubiquitous, is that when everybody has a platform, nobody really has a platform. So uh, we're starting to see the results of that. We have a lot of different voices out there, and we just don't know which ones to believe. So I, I have mixed ideas. I don't want to see uh, uh, Facebook or even local internet providers keeping different kinds of websites off. Uh, I want to hear what people think, and, I, and not necessarily people who, do, who agree with me. Uh, I think one of the things we have to fight is, is a filter bubbles that we all live in. If you're on Facebook, if you're on Instagram, if you're on social media, chances are you're hearing from your friends and your friends' likes and their news choices, and you're kind of in a bubble. You're not hearing the other side. You're not hearing maybe legitimate arguments or point of views that, that you need to be uh, to talking about. So I think social media has to be careful and people who control the gateways to social media have to keep it as open as possible. And net neutrality plays a role in that too. Uh, I just want it, I want to be able to check and I want to be able to hear and I want to be able to break outside of my cocoons. Thanks, really enjoyed the talk. Thank you, good questions. Any other questions? I know I yacked a lot and I did it quickly. <laughs> Well, you know, I just want you to know that this whole push for media literacy really 
uh, is important to me and it's important to the libraries in this state and it's important to the people who teach schools and i don't know if you know this but in montana right now it has some standards for informational literacy in the schools but only the school librarians are responsible for enforcing them and there's really not even a test or a standardized way to do that so it's not done really well in this state about 22 states have much more uh, robust laws about what they're going to teach in terms of information literacy in their schools to help students actually do this kind of critical thinking and boy this isn't just for students who are interested in in uh, in uh, politics uh, this is students who are studying health or studying science or studying history i can't imagine a subject where you don't need to be uh, literate in terms of information and where to find it and how to get it and how to evaluate it today. So uh, I'm really pushing for the schools to do more about information literacy. And I'm going to be meeting with uh, high school teachers who's, who teach information literacies in October to see if we can't get a little bit more uh, resources. Because one of the problems is there's not that many people teaching it and they don't have many resources and and uh, ways to do it. So it's it's awfully important and I just don't think we can overlook it. We focus on STEM, uh, math, science, and English, but we also need to focus on literacy too. Any other questions? You just answered my question, Dennis, about uh, what what's going on in at least Montana schools. So thank you for that. Um, and then one, I guess one final question from me would be, what do you recommend um, if parents wanted to take it into their own hands to teach their kids about media literacy? Like, I, I know I've read who said it, when did they say it, why did they say it, maybe, um, what other general quick questions do you think could be asked? Well, thank um, you. That's a great question. Okay. <laughs> Some of my slides, I just did a presentation on this for for a Montana Media Lab for just high school or, or for, for literacy teachers who are looking for resources. How do we teach this stuff? What lessons plans can we find? How can we get these kind of resources? And I am the best one that I've seen so far comes out of the Stanford History Educational Group. Uh, and it's free. The entire thing is free and it's constantly updated. It's part of a consortium that includes the Local News Alliance, it includes Google, it includes, uh, uh, you know, I don't know if you know Hank and John Green, the video bloggers who are so, so, so uh, viral kind of heroes, I guess, and, 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 and but they're spending their money on it. They've got crash courses on this. So uh, it's civic online uh, uh, resources. Uh, for media literacy out of the Stanford History Educational Group. Go to their website and you'll find you'll find stuff for short classes, for long classes, for, for entire semester curriculums. Some of the examples I had on my site come right out of their pages. Uh, I, you know, that the flowers that were just formed, that's one of theirs. How would you know? Where do you look for that stuff? How do you find that? That picture of the, the protest in Bahrain. How do you search photos? How do you do reverse, reverse photo search on Google? How do you search video? How do you take a clip of video and put it into some search engine and find out whether it's really a bat from that place or not? Uh, news people have to do this because we're using a lot of citizen journalism, but we have to vet it first. We have to see if it's true. Is it, did it come from there? How do we know that? We're suspicious by nature and everybody kind of has to be. Uh, uh, by now. I think if you're going to be, I also think you need a really good, and I think it was your husband who mentioned this, but he has a sounds like what sounds like a pretty good news diet, <laughs> you know, and I think, I think a, a friend of mine calls it news Uh Am I eating all their food groups? Like, am I getting my information from all the most nutritious kinds of sources? Uh, and I don't care if it counter contradicts each other sometimes. Uh, usually I want to find out where those contradictions are and then look into those. Uh, but uh, to have a really good broad source of stuff. And the final thing I would leave you with is 
is that uh, how important local news is to this. What's happening in Belgrade? What's happening in Bozeman? What's happening in Montana? Those are issues of tremendous importance to me. I'm getting ready to start school at the university here in a couple of weeks, and those decisions are really important. We're getting ready to have an election. How will that election be run in Montana? That's a story of great importance to a lot of people. We need people who are getting paid to answer these questions and follow these people. And we need people like Mike Dennison out of there fact checking all these political ads that you're seeing on both sides uh, of the spectrum. And that's a service that local journalists can provide that almost nobody else is gonna do. Uh, who else is gonna care about Montana? Who else is gonna care about Harlowton or Big Timber or, or Lewistown, you know? Uh, other than those local news organizations, and they're in trouble. Uh, and people need to support the ones that cover their areas and their communities. Uh, that also means you can be engaged with them. If you are getting a local paper or a local news organization, uh, talk to them. <laughs> Give them some feedback, you know. Uh, have them come talk to you and your, your groups. They would love to be telling you a lot of the things that I'm telling you too. So, uh, Thanks for the question and thanks for the group uh, for coming out on a Thursday night to do this. I appreciate it. Yeah, it was really interesting. I, I got a lot out of it, definitely. Well, thanks. I'm sorry I, I went so fast. No, but. yeah, there was a lot of information there. It's, it's, it makes sense. <laughs> well, Jennifer, I hope you did you well, have anything or? I didn't have a question. I just wanted to say thank you and I really enjoyed it. I loved it, thank you. <laughs> yeah, that was great. You know, a lot of it on the power, uh, the PowerPoint presentation that I shared, uh, if you can get a copy of that, or maybe I should just send it to you, uh, you can share that with people too. There are, there are notes under all those slides that tell you where those things came from uh, that, that talk more about the information. I change this stuff up weekly just to keep fresh in terms of the, the stories that we're talking about it. But now that you sort of see these things, it's, it's everywhere, you know? It really yeah. Is. Dennis, if you want to send it to me, I'm happy to share it with the participants' emails that I have. Um, and I think that's another final important, really important point is that it's not, um, you know, a one and done kind of thing. It's going to continue to need to be updated and there's always going to be new, new fake news <laughs> and new ways to try to trick people. So <laughs> Um, malicious or not. Um, so I, I'm going to remind everybody that I'm going to send that survey again through the chat. Um, and if you have multiple people watching, please have everybody fill it out. Um, just because that really does help Humanities Montana continue to get the funding that they get from the national organizations. And then it kind of does trickle down to Belgrade. Um, and I know we're very grateful to the Belgrade News. They do a lot um, with the library. We have very good partners over there and um, they're very willing to donate an ad if we purchase one so that we get kind of double exposure just because they've acknowledged that uh, we have the budget for it. So we, we pay for it when we can and then they are willing to help us out in the meantime. But um, any other final questions for Dennis before we, before we head out? I don't see any, but thank you everybody for participating and asking questions and, and being here. Um, and just make sure you fill out that survey and I will um, send an email to the participants with Dennis's slideshow um, afterwards. So I'll 